Hi, hello everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our final webinar session for YSIAC Conference 2021. Uh, for the first part of our session today, we're going to have ArpX Talk. So just to give a little history to this, uh, we first started doing this at the YSIAC Conference for 2019, two years ago. And the idea was to have a, a key speaker talk, uh, touch on primarily on non-arbitration topics, uh, topics of interest, very much along the lines of lifting up people generally and sharing personal insights. And for our first session, we had uh, Chris Chan, who was then with Ritmart, uh, share his personal insights as well as uh, professional development tips with quite a number of our participants back then. Uh, this year, we've had two speakers. So the first speaker we had was Fan Ziyang from the World Economic Forum Head of Digital Trade. And for our second session today, I'm very pleased to say that we have Mr. Kimin Nyam, uh, legal director at a company that doesn't need much introduction, Netflix, especially for those of us who are huge fans of the show, Squid Game. So um, Kimin has had a uh, varied career. He's had um, lots of insights to share with us. And when I first started talking with Kimin about the topics he might approach, uh, one of the things he talked about was contentment, um, quite aside from happiness. And eventually, I think he landed on the topic of how to be a happy and successful lawyer. So I think um, without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Kimin, uh, who will then share his personal insight with us. Thank you, Kimin, so much for doing this. No, not at all, Legion. Thank you. And thank you to YSIAC for giving me this opportunity to come and speak with uh, all of you and share some of my thoughts on the subject, right? How to be a successful and happy lawyer. Uh, for those of you who are also uh, listening in on this, thank you for choosing to spend your time with me instead of doing some 1111 uh, online shopping bargain hunting instead. So I hope something that I say today will be helpful to someone out there. Uh, and maybe it will even be more valuable to you than a new vacuum cleaner or a pair of shoes. Uh, maybe I'll start just by telling you a little bit about myself, giving you a quick overview of my story and my journey. So I grew up in Singapore in the 80s and 90s in an era before the internet when none of this would have been possible. After I finished my national service, I went to the United States to uh, continue my education. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college. And after that, I went to law school, again, in the United States, right? So choosing to spend seven years learning to become a lawyer rather than the uh, three or four that it takes in other Commonwealth jurisdictions. Uh, following law school, I then joined a large international law firm, Latham & Watkins, and I started off in their Los Angeles office uh, as a corporate lawyer working in tech and media at what was then a pretty exciting, interesting time. Uh, the iPhone was launched, uh, I think, a year or two after I started my legal career. And I have basically spent my entire career since then uh, working in the intersection of tech and media. I returned to Singapore uh, some years ago, transferring to the Singapore office of Latham & Watkins uh, to continue the journey and establish the tech and media practice in Asia. Following that, Netflix launched in Asia in 2016, and that's when I decided to make the switch to go in-house uh, to pursue what I thought was going to be a very new, fun, and exciting opportunity. Uh, it's definitely been that for sure, uh, and it's been an incredible experience helping to build our APAC business over the years, uh, and hopefully we have many more squid game uh, or squid games to come. Uh, in addition to th that side of my work and life, I've also been quite privileged and blessed uh, to be doing a lot of other stuff. For example, representing a number of individual and corporate pro bono clients. Uh, I've worked with an international human rights organization. I you know, was involved in starting a charity for homeless families in the US. I've served on the boards of several nonprofits uh, and also am an active angel investor as well. Uh, along the way and to this day, I've been blessed in all of these different aspects and facets of my professional life uh, and personal life as well, I should say, to have had many leaders, mentors, and teachers who have taught me a lot about life, a lot about being a lawyer, and I'm hoping that today I'll be able to share some of these lessons with you. These lessons will be framed by the question that was the lead in, uh, in the subject of this talk, which is how to be a successful and happy lawyer. I will start by saying that I don't think that this is a contradiction in terms. Successful, happy, and lawyer, I think are three words that can coexist uh, in the same sentence, in the same phrase. 
um, it is possible, right? I don't think that it's um, all joking aside. I don't think that you know there's any kind of contradiction in this whatsoever. And in fact, I think that you know, hopefully, whatever your vocation in life, it is possible to be successful and happy. However, since we are lawyers, I think it's important, obviously, to first start by understanding the definitions of these terms, right? So, what is success? What is happiness? I didn't look at a contract uh, for this. I did not look at Black's Law Dictionary or any kind of legal dictionary. Instead, I just checked a regular dictionary where it defines success as the achievement of a desired outcome or goal. So essentially, success is being able to accomplish something or accomplishing something. Happiness was defined as feeling contented, satisfied, or pleased. Now, if you think about these definitions as lawyers, it should be pretty apparent that both of these definitions actually require or reference something else, right, to give themselves meaning. Um, if, you, if you think about the definition of success, right, a desired outcome, well, what is that desired outcome? If you think about happiness, right, the feelings of satisfaction, pleasure, contentment, well, what is it that will make someone feel satisfied, pleased, content? To put it another way, if you want to be successful and happy, then you first have to start by knowing what success and happiness mean to you. What makes you feel truly accomplished and happy? Now, many people think that uh, the answer to the question of success, what is success, uh, might lie in material wealth and money, right? Financial success, financial gain. I think some people believe that the law is a great pathway to that. Right, there is this cliche that you know, you if you uh, certainly among Asian parents at least, that you know, if you your children should grow up to become lawyers or doctors because that's uh, you know, those are very well paying professions. And I would say, quite honestly, that that answer is correct up to a point, up to a certain point. Right, studies have shown time and time again that there is a correlation between how much money you have, how much income you make, and how happy you are. But the correlation only goes up to a certain income level after which and there is no clear correlation between the two whatsoever. Uh, for those of you who are in Singapore, you may be interested to know that that income level is about 93,000 uh, Singapore dollars a year. In other words, an income that puts you at the middle to upper middle income bracket, uh, but it's certainly not a level that makes you fabulously and you know, uh, insanely wealthy, for example. And then once you cross that $93,000 a year threshold, uh, for some people, more money does mean more happiness. For other people, it doesn't. Overall, looking at the population as a whole, there's no longer any clear correlation between those two different concepts. And so, generally speaking, social scientists would say about $93,000 to Singapore, the number goes up or down depending on the country you're in. That is about as far as money can take you in making you happy. Beyond that, it doesn't really add very much to your life or your happiness at all. So this brings me to the first lesson that I learned from uh, one of my mentors. Uh, and lesson number one, beware the golden handcuffs. So the mentor who taught me this was a very successful uh, litigator at a top US law firm uh, working on white collar cases, right? So white collar crimes, uh, securities uh, cases, things like that. She left all that behind to pursue a career in human rights law. She became an advocate and uh, fighting for the rights of victims of sex trafficking and fighting to free people from human slavery. And when I had a chance to get to know her and get to speak with her, um, she said that she, she learned very quickly that one of the traps of becoming a lawyer at a large law firm um, is the large income. Because it's great, right? When you're a student in law school, um, you probably don't really have that much money unless you come from a well-off family. And the concept and the thought of suddenly earning thousands and thousands of dollars um, is quite, quite uh, attractive and alluring. And for those of you who've been around a while and you've know, been in practice for a while, you, you may have noticed or sensed that maybe some of the people, some of the successful, quote unquote, successful lawyers that you see around you um, may to some extent, people are somewhat trapped in their jobs, right? Uh, they can't quit because their lifestyles have been built upon a certain income level, certain expectations of the standard of living, you know, eating in you know, uh, Michelin star restaurants every week, for example. And my mentor then at the time asked me, how much did I think my standard of living really needed to change between 
uh, living in law school or being in law school versus working at a law firm. And as I thought about it, my, my honest answer was not that much needed to change. Obviously, a lot could change, right? Making a uh, healthy and res uh, respectable income uh, definitely opened a lot of doors in terms of the standard of living that I was able to enjoy versus just kind of scraping by in law school. But how much really needed to change? Probably not all that much. So if you can avoid the trap of the golden handcuffs, you will find yourself clearing a major hurdle and obstacle that unfortunately has, I believe, tripped up a lot of lawyers um, in finding success. You will find that you, know, you will escape being trapped by your lifestyle, your expectations in a job that you might not really enjoy, right? that really might not bring you that much satisfaction or happiness. Um, and frankly speaking, at the end of the day, real success. Now, other people might say that, no, 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 the answer to the question about success is it's not about the money. It's not about the money, right? It's, um, it's about professional recognition. It's about being recognized as a leader in the field, uh, whether that's by making partner at the law firm, becoming general counsel if you're in-house, winning one of those um, 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 awards uh, that legal publications like to give out. These are what psychologists would call external validation, right? These are things that come from outside of you. They are awards and accolades, recognition given by other people. And there is nothing intrinsically wrong with external validation, right? External validation can be a good thing. However, there's also a real danger and risk, I believe, in building your success and self-worth primarily on what other people think about you. There's also the very real risk that the people who are giving out these awards and validations are using flawed measures of success. And when I say flawed, what I really mean is that these are not the measures of success that you ultimately may find meaningful to you, right? That just because that uh, some people measure success in a certain way, that doesn't mean that that's how you should measure success or that that will be a measure of success that you ultimately find meaningful for yourself. So in this comes lesson number two. You'll find your own success when you find your own meaning. This lesson I learned from another one of my mentors uh, in law school. Uh, this mentor was a transgender Vietnam War veteran and a well-respected criminal defense lawyer and civil rights activist. So I think this is generally true in law schools and legal professions around the world, but when I was in law school in the US, there was a very clear established understanding of what success looked like, right? a very clear path to it. You could get a summer clerkship uh, with a big and prestigious and well-paying law firm, and then you uh, basically don't screw up uh, during that summer associate uh, season that you had, and then they would give you an offer to come back as a full-time associate once you graduated from law school and passed the bar. And while there are some things about that that are very specific to the US context, I think the same principle generally holds in legal professions around the world. You go to law school, you graduate near the top of your class, you join a very well-respected uh, law firm uh, that pays you well, and, and that's it, right? That's the, that's the start of the path to success. Um, and I think it's a fine path, don't get me wrong, um, but conditional upon that being what you really want, right? If that's what you really want, then it's a fine path. The mentor that I had in law school never worked at a big law firm, never worked in, at a firm with you know, a, a, a large reputation uh, in that sense. And, and she challenged me to question this conventional path to success that law school and the legal system kind of held out as being the way to go, right? And I would encourage all of us to do the same as well, even though at this point, I think most of us, if not all of us are already out of law school. Um, you can only be successful following a conventional career path if that's really what success means to you. But if the thought of becoming partner at your law firm does not fill you with great joy and excitement and say, yes, that's really what I want to do, if the thought of becoming general counsel uh, wherever you are is not something that uh, you know, makes you like, really, really excited and gives you, gets, gives you drive every morning, um, that might not be what success really means to you. Maybe success to you really ought to be something else. So 
instead of relying then on all these external validations to prove success, I'd urge us to consider finding what the internal validation is, things that come from inside of you, right? Things that as you reflect and think about your life and what you value, uh, you will say, this is my desired goal or outcome. This is what I really care about. It could be family, it could be human rights, um, it could be lots and lots of different things. But don't just blindly follow or uh, unquestioningly do what our profession, what our society, what our system says is the path that you should take. Um, you'll find your own success by finding your own meaning. So those are my thoughts on success. Let me talk about happiness as well. So when I was doing some research for this talk, I was quite pleased and delighted to find that there has been quite a lot of uh, research done on the subject of happiness. And I, I majored in philosophy and behavioral science when I was an undergrad. And I found it quite interesting that actually there are more and more connections being drawn between these two schools and fields on the subject of happiness. So there are two old Greek philosophical concepts that date back thousands of years, right, um, that have generated renewed interest amongst uh, psychologists and neuroscientists uh, when it comes to the subject and topic of happiness. And these two concepts are hedonism on the one hand and eudaimonia. Hedonism is defined as the pursuit of pleasure and eudaimonia can be understood as the pursuit of a meaningful life. I, I would like to clarify that when the Greek philosophers use the term hedonism, uh, they did not have any negative connotations associated with the word. It was not a pejorative term. It was not a bad thing to be a hedonist um, in those days and in this sense. Right? It simply encompasses a broad range of behaviors uh, that bring pleasure. And to this philosophical Greek understanding, it could even include things like altruism right? and helping others. Uh, these were things that were considered uh, as pleasurable activities and hedonistic in that, in that particular sense of the word. So with that disclaimer out of the way, again, lawyers, disclaimers, um, Pleasure and hedonism are important, right? No one wants to be hungry. No one wants to not have their basic needs met. Um, Abraham Maslow was a famous psychologist in the 20th century who came up with this concept of a hierarchy of needs. There were certain things that people needed to have satisfied before they could find happiness and pleasure at a higher level. Uh, starting with basic things like having, you know, like enough to eat. Um, a roof over your head, you know, enough to provide for your basic needs, and then moving on up that, that hierarchy. There, there are some basic things that all of us need in order to have a certain level of satisfaction with life. But again, it isn't sufficient for happiness alone, right? Remember, there is no clear correlation between your income level and your happiness once you cross a certain threshold. Eudaimonia or meaning uh, eudaimonia, as I said earlier, right, can be translated or understood as the pursuit of a meaningful life, right, the, the good life or the life worth living. And I consider this to be the other meaningful part, uh, the other contributing part of being happy. This can be understood as finding value and purpose in your life, right, a reason to get up in the morning and understanding what matters to you. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I'd encourage you to go uh, on YouTube and find some of the talks given by Simon Sinek, who is a very well-known motivational speaker and expert on, uh, on the topic of human psychology. And he has a series called Finding Your Why. Really, really encourage you to go, go look it up. So I'll just start by respectfully submitting that uh, not all whys are objectively created equal. Uh, not all of them are of objectively equal value. So not all meanings are of equal value. Some why, some meanings are just, uh, are more likely than others to make a positive difference in the world and the lives of other people. And I would also observe that your why, your meaning is somewhat dependent on your experience of life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does take a personal encounter or experience of some difficulty, some hardship, uh, for you to really understand and find something that's worth striving for, that's worth pushing for in life. If you're sitting there and you're wondering what your why is, uh, don't worry, it's never too late. Um, and the other thing as well is that sometimes what we find meaningful in life can change 
over time, over the course of our lives. So with that said, what is your why? What matters to you? What gives you meaning and purpose in life? What do you find, what do you believe is worth fighting for? I believe that once you know this, once you understand what your why is, you will understand what you need to do to find happiness and success in life. And this is true as a lawyer, and it is more fundamentally true just as a human being. And one note, since I am speaking to a group of lawyers, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm led to believe many uh, younger lawyers, um, when you find your why, when you find something that you say, yes, this is worth fighting for, you might realize that this might actually mean that you need to leave the law behind, right? That your why, the thing that you are passionate about that gives your life meaning, might not be compatible with pursuing a career in the law. Personally, I find that a legal education and legal training is incredibly valuable, uh, no matter what you do. However, it might mean that you no longer call yourself a lawyer. You might leave the law firm, you might leave the practice of law and go do something else. Uh, but if that's what you need to do in order to find meaning and to find happiness, to find success, then I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And I would encourage us to be really open-minded about it. I do think it's great and wonderful to be a lawyer. I'm happy that I'm a lawyer. I don't think that law is the only thing in life. I don't think it's the only thing that I can do in life. And I encourage all of us to be more focused and think more about meaning, success, what do we really want to do and fight for uh, versus just blindly following a career or a path because society, our parents, our peers uh, think that that is what we ought to do because they think that that is what um, is held up by society, right? As being a worthwhile pursuit. So once you figure out your why, once you understand what you believe will give your life meaning, then you have a direction. You know what the goal is, that desired outcome, right? That is fundamental to and essential for success. Once you have that, um, I think then you are well on your way to finding success and happiness. As you continue on your journey towards success and happiness for you, um, let me close by offering some additional advice that I've received from other mentors in my life. The third lesson is to stay humble and curious always. This lesson I learned from a partner at uh, my old firm uh, when I was a very, very junior associate. Uh, this was a partner who led his practice group. He was a very respected uh, thought leader in his particular field. Um, and he knew tons and tons about his particular area of law. Right. He was widely known and recognized as the go-to um, in this subject matter. Yet he was always intensely curious um, and intensely humble about what he knew. And from him, I learned that you, you never know everything. You never know it all. And all of us always benefit by learning something new. I also learned from him the value of humility and going hand in hand with curiosity, by which I mean, if you believe you know something, then you'll never be able to learn it because you believe you already know it, and then you can't learn something new about it. But by being curious and learning, we can continually improve ourselves and we open ourselves up to growth. And this can be true in a particular legal field and area of law. And I think it can be true in life in general as well, right? We should always strive to be curious, to seek to understand the world around us. Lesson number four, show up and be available day after day. This lesson I learned from a mentor who had built her life and her reputation um, as a political uh, staffer. She worked for a couple of different US senators and congressmen in Washington, DC. And then she subsequently became a leader on issues on human rights policy and law. And over her long career spanning many, many decades, she said that the one thing that she had learned was that you have to show up, you have to be available, you have to be ready and willing to do the work. It's hard to get the right opportunities to advance in your career and to progress um, in towards success, whatever that means for you. But it's even harder to do that if you don't consistently show up, right? If you don't stick around and make yourself available and willing to do the work. If you rely solely on luck to advance your career, at some point your luck will turn or you might not even get that lucky break that you need, 
right? The, there is a lot of hard work that goes into it. There's a lot of just being humble and being willing to do what needs to be done. I do, I will say that I do believe this is uh, harder in a largely work from home environment, uh, but it's not impossible, right? There are ways to do it, uh, putting up your hand virtually, uh, staying in touch with people, saying, you know, is there anything I can do to help? Uh, making sure people understand that you're available and willing uh, to help with whatever needs to be done, right? Not thinking that you're too good, too senior, too whatever uh, to do a particular task. If you think something isn't worth your time, if you think you're too good for it, it's not a good use of your time, uh, I, I do feel that it's unlikely that opportunities will come to you, right? People will start thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna go to so-and-so for this particular issue. Let me find someone else, someone who is asking me for work, someone who is uh, offering, proactively offering uh, to help on this particular matter. I'll close with perhaps the most important lesson that I've learned, right? So it's been, for those of you who are keeping score, four lessons, beware of the golden handcuffs. Uh, number two was if you, um, find, finding your own success is contingent on finding uh, your own meaning. Lesson number three was to stay humble and curious, four is to show up and be available day after day. But lesson five, I think, is perhaps fundamental to everything, right? Um, just life in general. Um, and lesson number five is this. Work is temporary, but people are eternal. I'll say it again. Work is temporary. People are eternal. This is a lesson that I learned from almost every single mentor and teacher that I've had in my life. Uh, in fact, it was even repeated back to me by one of my teammates yesterday. Your cases will come and go. Your matters will come and go. They will pop up, they will be litigated, arbitrated, you know, fought over, uh, negotiated over, and they will be resolved and life will move on. The circumstances of life will change all the time. And clients, for example, who are on opposite sides of a fierce dispute today may end up being business partners or even friends tomorrow. And my question to you is, can the same be said of their counsel? Can the same be said of you? At the end of every matter of every case that you are on, will the other side be able to say at the end of it all that you treated them fairly, that you did not try to take unfair advantage of them, uh, that they felt that you accorded them dignity and respect in the way that you interacted with them, even in the way that you disagreed with them um, and litigated or fought uh, with them, that you were kind and considerate of them as people, even while you were staunchly advocating for your client. Another way to look at this is something that one of my, again, one of my partners in my old firm said, um, we, we hope to be the kind of team when at one day when the other side is in trouble, they will come to us, right? When the lawyers who are fighting and litigating against are in trouble one day and they need their own legal counsel, we want to be the team that they come to, uh, that they will want to hire us because we're good, uh, but also because they enjoy working with us, right? They believe that we treat treated them well, even though we were on opposite sides of a dispute. And this is rooted in a very fundamental principle of human psychology, right? Which is this, reciprocity. People remember people who treat them well, and they want to treat them the same. This is just something that's innate in human nature. In every, I, I do believe it's almost a societal universal. If people treat you well, you will want to reciprocate and treat them well. And I think if you do this, if you're able to remember this principle and treat people well, um, it will pay off and reap dividends for you throughout your life and be a valuable um, guide and principle on the journey towards success and happiness. So that's it. That's all I have for you today. Uh, I hope some of these lessons will help you on your journey of success and happiness. And I wish you all the best.